Good evening and welcome to our adult program series at the Hedberg Public Library. Tonight's speaker is historian and author Jerry Epps, here to talk about the writing of his new book, Ringlingville, USA, the stupendous story of seven siblings and their stunning circus success. I said it. <laughs> Born and raised on a Wisconsin farm, Jerry is now a professor emeritus at UW-Madison and a writer for state and national publications. He has written more than 15 books, most of them on rural history and country life. For his writing, Jerry has won awards from the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Library Association, Wisconsin Council for Writers, Robert E. Gard Foundation, and others. Please welcome Jerry Apps. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, is the sound working okay? You can hear in the back row. I want to first uh, uh, comment on this uh, uh, picture, uh, which uh, the original of this goes back to uh, 1887. And the gentleman who brought it, where is he? Right here. And I'm, I'm not remembering your name because I want to recognize you. Clarence Schultz. Clarence Schultz is a person who has collected uh, circus uh, material for a long time and this belongs to, uh, to Clarence. He's also been a volunteer at, at uh, Circus World Museum in Baraboo and has a long uh, time interest in circus. This picture is especially interesting because, and I'll get into some of how the Ringlings used advertising uh, after a bit, but this predates the time when each of them wore a big mustache. Their trademark were five brothers in a row with big mustaches. And notice that only a couple of them have uh, mustaches in that picture. So thank you very much for bringing that along, that, 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 that adds. How many of you have uh, had an opportunity to see a circus under canvas? Quite a bunch of you. That's great. <clears throat> because what I'm going to do this evening is share with you uh, some of the history of the, uh, of the Ringling Brothers. And I'm going back to uh, when August uh, Ringling, their father, uh, first arrived in uh, Wisconsin in 1848. He had, uh, from Germany, he had spent a year in uh, Canada uh, before coming uh, to Wisconsin. The, the title of my book is Ringlingville, USA. And just a comment or so on the word Ringlingville. How many of you have been to Circus World Museum in, uh, in Baraboo? If you haven't, uh, do, uh, do plan to, to stop up there. Uh, it's one of our uh, national treasures uh, to have uh, here in Wisconsin uh, one of the last, if not the last, original set of winter quarter <coughs> circus buildings in North America. Uh, right in a little Baraboo. Just, uh, so if you've not had a chance to stop up there, uh, and if you haven't been up there recently, uh, they have in the last uh, several years done some uh, refurbishing of several of the uh, old buildings. Uh, for instance, the horse barn uh, was a beautiful, is still a beautiful old barn that uh, housed a hundred uh, horses. Well, Ringlingville referred to the winter quarters for the Ringling Brothers the years that they stayed uh, and spent their winters in, uh, in Baraboo. But Ringlingville also was what they called their circus when they were on the road. And for me, that is so fascinating to think of this circus, 12 and, and 1912, 13, along in there during their heyday, 1,200 employees. 500 horses, 45 elephants, assorted lions, tigers, and all of that, essentially moving every day, one city to the one town and city to the next. 85 rail cars and three trains. They broke up the 85 into three units. And think about this. They would come into a town like Janesville, and Janesville was one of their popular stopping places. I have several uh, references to Janesville in the, in the book. Newspaper articles uh, are about the time when 
the times that they stopped in, in Paisley. And think about this, they would arrive, the first train of 20 some cars would arrive in, let's say, Janesville at about 4 o'clock in the morning. They would immediately unload, and on that first, car, on that first train, uh, was the, uh, one of the things was the cook tent. And they would, wherever the, the grounds uh, were, and sometimes the grounds were more than a mile away from where they unloaded. So they hitched up the teams and the wagons and went to the showgrounds. And the first thing they did was set up the, the cook tent. And about an hour later, the second train arrived. And about an hour or so after that, the third train arrived until all 1,200 people now are there. And all these tents are going up. And the tents, by 1915, they had 17 tents that took up 14 acres of land. It was indeed a city, and that's why they called it Greenville. The big top, the largest tent, the show tent, in uh, 1915, was 190 feet wide, 540 feet long, and held up to 15,000 people. The football field is 300 feet long. To give you some sense of this tent being 540 feet long. And they would come into Janesville, and three trains, 1,200 people, set up all these tents. One of the tents, of course, was the blacksmith tent. Another tent was the barber shop. And they had their own post office. That's where I got the idea that they were calling themselves Ringlingville while they were on the road. Because Jules, Jules Turnau was a clown for many years for the Ringling Brothers. And when all these trains arrived and when Jules Turnau arrived in Janesville, the first thing he would do would be to unload a, 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 a buggy in one of the, one of the horses. And he would drive his buggy and horse to the Janesville post office and pick up the mail for these 1,200 employees. Because everyone knew ahead of time where the circus was going to be. It was printed. All the employees knew where they were going to be. And, and so they would collect their mail. And, and I have a picture in the book of, of Jules Turnau passing out mail in front of a wagon that had above it Ringling. I think that's just fascinating because here now is a city, a, a good-sized city, 1,200 people in the early 1900s was a good-sized town, moving every day, and not just moving, feeding 1,200 people three meals a day, feeding all of these uh, horses and assorted uh, other hay burners and meat eaters and, and all of those kinds of uh, animals that they had. Uh, and, and putting on a parade, usually by about 11 o'clock in the morning. A parade that was some, so spectacular that people would come from miles around just to see the parade. I have a note in here that the barbers absolutely hated the ringlings because they knew their Saturday business was shocking. <laughs> because people would not want to miss the parade and the afternoon shows. They would put on a matinee and an evening show <coughs> And by the time that the last person went into the evening show, the first train was already on its way to the next time. Armies from around the world came to watch how in the world was it possible for 1,200 people, all these horses, all these elephants, all these animals, putting on two shows a day plus a parade, how could they do that? It was an amazing, amazing thing what they did. And mind you, this was before there were very many automobiles. <coughs> automobiles were just coming in in the early 1900s. Before computers, obviously, before radio. Uh, all of this was going on and organized with such precision that if you would look at your clock, your watch or clock, you would know if at 8 o'clock you knew exactly what was going to happen. Because they worked with that kind of precision 
day after day after day, six days a week. And they were German Lutherans. They took off Sundays. Not that they do for Germans, but they took off uh, always Sundays. Very seldom, a few times, but not very often. So that, that's, the, that's the name, that, that's where the name of the book came from, Ringlingville. Invariable, but also on the road. Ringlingville, the year around. The time frame for the book, and this, uh, his book is published by the Historical Society, Wisconsin Historical Society. So it is um, as historically accurate as four editors and I could make it, plus readers all over the country who were certain as historians. I've never had a piece of work so analyzed by so many people <laughs> to make sure that it was accurate. And somebody here is probably going to march and go, oh, you screwed up on page 24. <laughs> but we tried. 18, so the, the, the basic time period is 1848 uh, to, uh, to 1918. And then just to run back and give you some sense of what happened along the way. There were seven Ringling brothers and they had one sister, I guess, the youngest. Five of the brothers were partners. And I'm going to say something about each of them in a little while. Two other brothers worked for the five. The five brothers were partners. They never had a written contract. All the years that they worked together, they never had a contract. It would have been a good thing that they had a contract once they started passing away because there were lots of problems with, with heirs and inheritance and all that. But when they were actively working, they had, uh, they had no contract. 1848, as I mentioned earlier, August Ringling, now listen to this, he spelled his name R-U, it was spelled in Germany, R-U-N-G-E-L-I-N-G. R-U-N-G-E-L-I-N-G. -E that was the German. And it sounds pretty much like rung, rungling or ringling, um, but he, the first thing he did, the first, first few months he was in law, was to change his name, to the spelling to R-I-N-G, L-I-N-G. Okay, 1918, the other end uh, of the history was when they left there. So I concentrated on the time, and they were no longer the Ringling Brothers Circus in 1919, because that's when they combined with Barnum and Bailey and became Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey combined shows. Let's go back to how these boys uh, got going and where they got an idea uh, for a circus. Because to me, that's a fascinating question. Where, how in the world would a bunch of uh, lads, without any money, uh, without any uh, external financing of, of any kind, <coughs> Where would they get the idea for a circus, and how did they get it going? Their father was a harness maker. August Ringling was a harness maker, and a very good one. But think of this. This is now 1848, we're, we're harnesses, big demand, horses everywhere. Uh, by um, 1860, the start of the Civil War, still a lot of demand, but Whenever there was a recession or a depression, and we had them, just as we now know of them coming and we, we are aware of them, that is not a new thing. We've had recessions in our history, economic recessions for a long time. August Ringling moved his uh, family uh, from Milwaukee, and he'd spent a little time in Chicago, uh, to Baraboo in 1855. He had two sons then, Al. Gus, Al was the oldest. And Al Ringling uh, is, the, uh, is one of my favorites of, of the boys. Um, the Al Ringling Theater in Baraboo. Uh, Al Ringling's home is, is still there for, for, for you to see. Um, of, of, and this is a little trivia for you, too. Of all of the brothers, all, all seven of them, only one was born in, in, in Baraboo. The Otto. Just one son born in so they arrived in Baraboo in 1855, and August uh, Ringling started uh, what he called a one-horse harness shop. And here's what he, uh, in an ad in the Baraboo Republic, uh, he wrote this. Uh, and he had a, he had a sense of, uh, of flair 
uh, which was uh, amplified by his, uh, by his sons as they got into the business. He, he sold bridles and trunks and valises and whips and whip lashes and stirrups and curry combs and brushes. And, and here's, here's a quote now from his head. And he, he wrote about himself in third person. His motto is to com accommodate all who would buy of him and those who will uh, and, and, and those who will not and those who will will not suffer a loss. All are invited to come immediately, for there is danger of them being gone in a short time. Now if any are desirous to know where these cheap things stay, they will crowd their way to the shop of the undersigned nearly opposite the Sumner House, A. Ring. As a researcher, I love finding these old ads and old newspaper articles because the way the journalists and, and ad writers use language in those days was absolutely fascinating. Ringling got into, August Ringling got into uh, financial trouble in the late 1850s and moved to McGregor Isle in 1860. And in McGregor, Iowa, which is just opposite Prairie du Chien, how many of you have been to McGregor? It's kind of an interesting little town. Uh, it's still a, a very important uh, river town, and it was then, and, and perhaps even more important then, uh, because just before the Civil War, people who were going west, a lot of people going through the Midwest to the west, would go through McGregor. And that's where they would get their harnesses tuned up. That's where they might buy <coughs> horses and equipment and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so McGregor was a, was a booming town. And in McGregor, Alf T. Charles, John, and Henry were all born. Four sons were born in McGregor. Now, during the Civil War, 1861 <coughs> to 65, nothing much happened, of course, because the country uh, was so um, involved with the Civil War, and especially the nothing much happened on the Mississippi River. All the shipping was essentially stopped. But after the Civil War, one of the first kinds of river boats that began traveling north from Louisiana, New Orleans, and St. Louis were, were circus boats. There were circus boats that went up and down the Mississippi River, and they stopped at all, obviously, they would stop at all the river towns on their way up to St. Paul and then turn around and come back and stop at the river towns. And that's where the Ringling boys had a chance to see their first circuses. As little kids, can you imagine how they're poor? Oh, they're so poor. I, 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 if, if there had been such a thing as welfare, they would have been on it. Because I found some reference to people that, who were giving them clothing and food because they, they just weren't making it. They had a big family and the Harness business wasn't that powerful. But they, these little boys saw it's an elephant. They saw these horses performing with a big tent. And, and anybody as a kid that saw the circus, the thing you wanted to do was to, was to go home and, uh, and, and try it out yourself. So the Ringlings even went a step further. I mean, they really got serious as little kids in putting on their own circus. Here's um, uh, an oral history uh, that I found in McGregor. I spent uh, several days in McGregor, uh, Iowa, researching this book. And here's how this person described the Ringling Boys' first service, or one of their first ones when they were kids. There was a parade down Main Street and over to a barn. The brothers had an outside animal show before admittance to the performance. The animal show consisted of cats, dogs, several rabbits, two <laughs> tiny kittens, with a sign from Timbuktu, a monster bullfrog with a sign, captured at great risk from the depths of the faraway swamp from which no other frog collector ever emerged alive, <laughs> a crowing rooster with tail feathers colored bright red, a bantam pullet which laid an egg while the neighbors were seeing the animals, some tadpoles swimming in a glass container in which to the amazement of the boys, some tiny frogs emerged in time for the show. A white hen and rooster, the only ones in captivity. Some English sparrows, imported from an unnamed Pacific island. <laughs> and Mrs. Ringling's canary, the head of the great dynasty. 
the boys performed on swings and walked across a long beam. The dogs set up a great barking. The cats became frightened and pandemonium seemed about to break loose when the elder wrangling boy fed them with some meat, which he was supposed to bring home for supper. <laughs> Well, uh, that's the first evidence of a circus that they put on. And they charged, it was called a pin circus. Straight pins were very valuable in those days. So to come see their circus, you might pay, as a kid, three straight pins. So it was a pin, pin circus. Well, by 1871, and this was going on now right after the, the Civil War, by 1871, August Ringling was in dire straits again, and, and in 1872, he moved his family to Prairie du Chien, across the river, where they lived for a while. And by that time, uh, Al Ringling, who really, from the time he was a youngster, seeing this first circus, he was the oldest, uh, never got over his interest in, uh, in circus performance. He started out as a, as, a performance, as a performer. And he was a juggler. And, and he also was a tight, a tight rope walker. I suppose kids would you'd string a hay fork rope between a couple of trees and walk across. Have any of you tried that? <laughs> I used to dumb stuff like that when I was a kid on the farm. I never tried that. Um, and, and then he, he, he juggled everything he could get a hold of. And he became known for being able to juggle on his chin a wooden beamed breaking plop. And people would come from miles around to see Al Ringling. You all know what a breaking plow is? It has a great big thick beam and a great long mold board. It's the kind of a plow that was used to, to break land and plows and he would balance his thing right in his chin. Right? People would come from miles around uh, to see uh, Al Ringling balancing a plow on his chin. Well, from Prairie du Chien, and August Ringling uh, moved a lot uh, with his family. From, from uh, Prairie du Chien, they moved to Stillwater, Minnesota uh, in 1875. And he, he moved up there without any work and, and lined up, and he couldn't find a job. And so at that time, he moved back to Barrow. 1875, he moved back to Barrow. And he started working for his uh, brother-in-law, uh, Henry Miller, who was a wagon maker in, uh, in Barrow at the time. By this time, Al had left home, and he was working in, in several circuses, uh, honing his skills as a juggler and learning the circus business, and all the while hoping and trying to figure out a way that he could start a circus. And trying to convince his brothers, which didn't take a lot of convincing, that they should, uh, they should come along with him. So three of the brothers, Al, Alf, T, and Charles, organized in 1882 the Ringling Brothers Classic and Comic Concert Company. They had a great flair for language. The Ringling Brothers Classic and Comic Concert Company, which was a, a kind of vaudeville show. And they opened in <coughs> Maze and Maze. That's where, they're, where they first performed. On November 27, 1882, they went to Maze and Maze because they didn't want the, the, the young people, their friends around Baraboo and Sauk City to see them because they were a little rusty. They figured, well, they were. They were trying to figure out how to do this. Well, there in Mesa Maine, and later, uh, Alf T., who was the writer in the group, uh, and he wrote a, wrote a book and described what happened on that first uh, November 27th opening day. Here's what he said. It was a cold November morning when the boys left their parents' home to give their first show as professionals. A light snow had fallen during the night, and the morning air was crisp and clear. The boys loaded their trunks and musical instruments on wagons and set off for Sauk City, where they boarded the train to Mesa Mania. 
They opened in an opera hall, in the opera hall in downtown Mazamini, which was a farming town, 35 miles or so west of Madison. The boys' plan was to travel far enough from Baraboo so no one would recognize them. <laughs> not at all bashful in proclaiming the virtues of their efforts, their program stated, do not say this, do not fail to see the many attractions presented by this company. See our prize-worthy and unequaled program. And then Alf T. is describing what happened. We had a $13 house, but the 15, 59 people composing the audience looked bigger to me than an audience of 15,000 under our tents today. It seemed as if every individual knew our history and was more aware that this was our first attempt, if not perhaps our first offense, and was ready to guy and laugh at our efforts. That's how we got started. And they did just like they did in later years with their circus. They went from town to town, putting on these hall shows, as they were called, every night. And they would put on a little parade in the afternoon. Uh, March down Main Street, they played instruments, uh, more or less. Some of them played quite well. Charles was quite a, quite a good musician. Otto uh, could barely beat on the, keep the beat on the big drum. Suggested, but they paraded on Main Street, put on this little show, and went on um, from town to town to town in Wisconsin, in Iowa, in Minnesota, trying to earn enough money so they could put on a circus. And by 1884, two years later, on the 19th of May, they opened their first circus, their first legitimate circus, in Baraboo, May 19th, 1884. And they got some help from an old circus man called Yankee Robinson, uh, who knew a lot about circuses and had been in the circus business for a long time. And Yankee Robinson uh, uh, helped them out, and it was a, a wagon circus, meaning that they went from town to town by horse and wagon. Unbelievable. Uh, 10, 12 wagons all strung out, going through the hills of of the southwestern Wisconsin, over toward Richland Center and down toward Dodgeville. And, like and every, they, they would drive all night and, and put their circus on the next afternoon and then dry and after and evening and then drive all night again. And can you imagine what it would have been like? I, I would have loved to have seen this parade of wagons going by and, and all of a sudden, here's the elephant! walking down the country road. I mean, that's how everything moved. They didn't have elephants at first. But while there was still a wagon show, they had elephants. And the wagons, the wagons were essentially driven by farm boys who thought, oh, how exciting it would be to run away and be with the circus. And it was exciting until it started to rain, <laughs> until it started to snow. That's the kind of stuff they ran into in the early spring. And all of a sudden, these farm boys decided that a, a warm meal and a, and a cozy bedroom would be a lot better than driving a team of horses all night in the rain. They disappeared. And, and they have to recruit some new uh, wagons and some new farm boys. The, those first days, uh, first years as a circus were um, really something. And I, I have a whole description of all of that. They became a railroad circus in 1890. And of course, that opened up North America to them. That opened up everything from Maine to California, from Texas to uh, Manitoba. Uh, and they took advantage of that. From 1890 on uh, to 1918, uh, those were really the, uh, the glory years uh, for the Ringling Brothers. Uh, as they expanded every year, uh, they got larger. So just a little bit about the brothers to give you some sense of who they were. Because as, as I did the research for this, and, and let me just stop for a moment and sidetrack and tell you that a lot of the research I did in Baraboo, there's a, a wonderful museum and library, uh, a library connected with the museum at, uh, at Baraboo, where I did a lot of my work. But I also did a lot of work in Columbus, Ohio. In the basement of a, of a gentleman's home in Columbus, Ohio, I found many of the early records, the account books, the employment records, the letters 
that the Ringling Boys uh, wrote to performers and, and to each other. <coughs> and anybody working as a historian, that's what you want to get your hands on, that original material. Material, uh, it, it, it's almost, uh, it, it gives you sort of a shiver when you open up an account book and you know the handwriting is, uh, is Otto Ringling's because he was the treasurer for, for the group. And, and, and very meticulous uh, man was Otto. But let's a little bit about the brothers. Uh, Al, uh, Al Ringling was the oldest, and I've said something about his uh, interest in, uh, in uh, juggling and performance. He became what was called the equestrian director, which meant he was not only in charge of horses, which that's not, but he was in charge of performance, all of the performance. He was the ringmaster. Uh, he kept everything going, bing, 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 bing. You could time it, as I mentioned earlier. He also had an uncanny ability to know when to have a high uh, a trapeze act, when to have, a, a, when to have the elephants uh, prayed in, and he balanced all of that. Uh, so Al became just an un, it was, and became even better at, uh, at performance and keeping the show moving. Otto was the treasurer. Uh, by the way, Al was married uh, fairly early on, and his wife, was active in the circus as well. She was a snake charmer at one time. Uh, yeah, and was a very, very interesting. Lou, uh, was her name. very interesting. Otto never married. Uh, financial genius, tremendous reader, had a substantial library. He was so frugal, he never owned a house. He, he lived with his brother, uh, pinched every penny, in some ways kept them afloat when things were tough. Elf T. Elf T, very interesting fellow. He was the, in charge of press relations. As I mentioned earlier, he was a writer. And he uh, oversaw a whole cadre of uh, public relations writers. Uh, for, for instance, they would write the reviews for the show. The show was coming to Janesville. The, the Elf T would have in his hand the review of the show before the show ever was performed. And, and he, would, he would come see the the Janesville newspaper editor, every town had a newspaper in those days, and he would go into the newspaper office and he would say, oh, the editor, meet the editor, shake his hand, take him out, take him to the tavern for a drink, buy him dinner, say, oh, by the way, I know how busy you are, here's the review that you can just sort of slip into the paper. And, and so, I don't know that Janesville editor did this, I hope he didn't, but a lot of editors did, because when you read the, the material as a researcher, when you read the newspaper reports, all of a sudden, you went, geez, they all sound alike. <laughs> well, they all sound alike, they all sound alike because they all T wrote them all. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Um, Charles. Where is Charles? Right in the middle. Uh, he was responsible for advertising and promotion. They were very, very big on advertising. And I want to share a little bit of that in just a moment. He oversaw all these bill posters that went all over the country, plastering these huge posters colorful posters. And to the point that the ringlings were big on color, as all circuses were, two colors were very, very important to them, red and yellow. And the ringlings even had their own shade of red, ringling red. And I tried my darndest to find some kind of, of evidence of that, and I didn't. Uh, but the, the word was, and many people shared this with me, this is ringling red, a special red. In this poster. Um, so uh, Charles was in charge of all of that. John, John was the person in charge of scheduling. He was the railroad guy. He knew all the railroad routes in all over the country. Uh, he was able to um, figure out which towns the circus should play the following year. And he was so uncanny about it, he, he would study what was, the, um, uh, what was the wheat crop like in North Dakota this year. And it wasn't very good. There isn't going to be much money in North Dakota, so maybe we're going to skip North Dakota this year. That's, that's the kind of mentality that went into John Ringling planning where the circus would go. Some said that he was so good at it 
that you could blindfold him and take him anywhere in the country and have him stick his head out the window, he can tell you what state he was. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a lot of exaggeration in the circus, and that, that sort of goes along with it. Uh, so those, those were the five, uh, the five brothers. And one of the reasons they were so successful is that they had this, uh, the, the, this diversification of jobs. They split up their work so that each one of them had the jobs that I just mentioned, and they did their jobs very well, and they didn't interfere with each other. Otto made the, the financial decisions, and, and nobody challenged them. Except at the end of the year, they all gathered in Baraboo, and in, there's, a little, there's a little house that, look, that looks like a farmhouse, which was their office. And they would gather in that office every time at Christmas. Season was over. By that time, they pretty, Otto pretty much figured out if they made any money or not. And they would sit around and decide what next year's program was going to look like. Where they were going to go, what kind of shows they were going to put on, all of that sort of thing. Because they're, they're artists and design people and PR people had to start work that worked over, over the winter. And this, as the story goes, there were horrific arguments. These five guys argued sort of the roof about raised. And when the day was done, they all lit up big, long cigars, shook hands, and they had <coughs> these wonderful big family Christmas celebrations in Baraboo every year. Once they decided what they were going to do, that was it. There wasn't any questioning. I found some interesting letters where they were along the way, when they were trying to decide on what they were going to do, they were questioning each other. But once they, once they made the decision, uh, that was it. Two other brothers, um, Gus and Henry, uh, worked for the five, and, and Gus was in charge of advertising car number one, and Henry uh, was the youngest and the biggest. And, and by the way, one of the problems these guys had, they all ate too much. It's true. They, 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 I think that may have been partly due to the fact that they were so poor, and they were always concerned about whether or not they are going to have another meal the next day, so they wanted to make sure that they were set. And, and so they ate too much. And they never quit working either, I think, for that same reason. I, and everything may fall apart this year, and, and I, I, so I've got to keep at it. And they, every one of them, they dived into the traces. They, they, did not, they did not retire. Henry was six foot three, weighed over 300 pounds. And he was superintendent of the main entrance to the tent, to the big town. That, that was his, one of his jobs. And then he became a partner in 1911, Otto was the first uh, of, the, of the five to die, and, and then uh, Henry became a partner. Well, a little bit about uh, advertising. I want to, I'll talk for another five minutes or so, and then I'll some time for questions. Uh, advertising was such an important thing for the Ringlings. Uh, and in fact, I was flattered, uh, last Friday, I, I lectured to a marketing course in the journalism department, a bunch of students taking a marketing course and how the Ringlings did their advertising. They studied, they studied this book and how the Ringlings did advertising. And, and this was advertising now uh, about 100 years ago, and, and still, a lot of what they were doing was still very, very much appropriate. Some of what they did, let me look at it today as uh, maybe over the top, to use the present day language. Uh, you all know uh, about uh, uh, P.T. Barnum. Most people know about P.T. Barnum, who was associated with Barnum and Bailey. But P.T. Barnum also ran a science museum in New York City at one time. And P.T. Barnum was a huckster of the first order. Uh, he, he convinced a, a, a biology professor that the mermaid that Barnum had constructed was authentic. It was the real thing. I don't know where this professor was. And a visit to the bar before they went to look at the mermaid. Uh, then another one of his famous things, which I think is just hilarious. Uh, if you visit the museum, I think it cost a quarter uh, to visit the museum. And you pay a quarter, you went, and you about halfway through, uh, there was a there's a big sign that said egress. And then there was a hero. And people, boy, I want to see that egress. Yeah. And of course they end up in the alley. And that means exit. She had to come around back in again for another quarter. 
<laughs> well, that, was, that was P.T. Barnum. Well, the, the Ringlings came pretty close to that because in one of their ads, uh, which I, I think is just hilarious, this is 1901, right? and this was a, a Ringling ad. The only giraffe known to exist in the entire world. <laughs> 20000 was the price he cost. Not a million, not a million, times a million could buy another. He is the last, the only one, the single, sole, and lonely survivor of a once numerous race. <laughs> well, I suppose if you've never seen a giraffe before, and now there's one, they're, they're and that's the only one, I better go see it. Well, that really got me thinking. Now, I've got all this material, all these papers. Could I find the truth of the matter? And I did. The actual cost of this giraffe, I, I found the bill of lading, the purchase for it, uh, was $4,042.65. $3,462.95 went to Carl Hegenbeck, a German animal dealer, $579.70 with the United States Express Company for shipping the giraffe from Germany to the United States. So that's a long way from $20,000, uh, $4,000. And, and of course, most of us, I think, realize that there were one or two other giraffes still around at that time. They, um, the Ringlings did a lot of very legitimate advertising, too, and I want to tell you, just a little bit about that. The era of the, of the late 1800s was the era of the lithograph. This is a, a, a replica of a, lipo, of a lithograph. Lithography, the, the art of creating lithographs, all of a sudden uh, provided a pretty bleak um, environment for many, many rural people and small town people especially, with some color, some very vivid color. And the circus learned how to take advantage of the stopping ability of something colorful. And the fact that when you were driving a horse in a buggy, you just weren't in a hurry. There wasn't any way to be in a hurry. And you'd see one of these big posters, and they had a lot of detail, a lot more detail than this one. And people, you'd stop and look at it. Uh, and it would tell you the program, the circus program, the, the whole schmear. So lithography was, was a very big deal. And these sheets, some of them are huge. They, they, they'd be, well, you had a sheet that was, what, seven by 10 feet? No. <coughs> now, here's how it worked. The Ringlings had rail cars specifically designed for advertising. And they had a crew at one time of 70-some uh, 70, 70 men. That's all they did was put up these big posters. And here, here's how it worked. The first advertising rail car would come rumbling into Janesville on the back end of a freight or the back end of a passenger train. And they would, the engineer put off on a sidetrack. And these 25, 30 men in this car would spend the night in the hotel in Janesville at the crack of dawn. They would be at the livery stable, uh, hitching up their teams that they had rented. They'd arranged to rent these teams. And they would travel 20 miles in every direction from Janesville, putting up these big lithographs, these posters, on the sides of barns and fences and wherever they could find a place to put them. And they were not done willy-nilly. Every sign was put up with permission. Every sign was put up with a signed contract. The farmer, I've got examples of a little contract. Sign a little contract. And what they, the payment was two tickets to, to see the service. Now, in this rail car, they had a great big kettle where they boiled paste which was made out of wheat flour and water. Stribble is paste, big cauldron of paste steaming, and every one of these buggies had a supply of paste to go along with the lithographs as they traveled up and put up all those signs. Three weeks before the circus arrived, this was happening. This first car comes to Janesville. Two weeks before, another car with another group of guys, and they, they go out to make sure that all these signs are still up, 
And if any of them are torn, they put up some more. Uh, they replace them. A week before, another car comes by, make sure all the signs are still up, and put up some new ones. There's a lot of competition, of course, another circus might come in, plaster a sign up. So they, their advertising was just really uncanny. Uh, there, there was, these 75 people never saw the circus. Can you imagine that? They were always from one to three weeks ahead. And they spent one day in a town, and the next day in another town. They had the same kind of schedule as the circus. Six days a week, six new towns, and, they, and, and it's got to have been a little tiresome, you would think, because from May till October, that's what they did. Of course, they got into a lot of interesting places, met a lot of interesting people, and it's got to have been an interesting life. So that was a little bit of the advertising. And what did it do? Well, it brought in, as I mentioned, the town might be 5,000 people, 15,000 people would show up, maybe twice that afternoon, 15,000. Another 10, not quite as many in the evening. Most farmers didn't want to drive home in the dark for more, or true. More people came in the afternoons than, than, than the students. So I think with that, I'm going to sort of put a screech to it and deal with some of your questions because I know one of the questions, why in the world would a circus want to winter in Peru? <laughs> well, you could winter in Sarasota, Florida, which is where they later did. Why did they do that in Bear? Because that's where their folks lived. Uh, they, they, it, was, it was their place. It was their home. That's where Ma and Pa uh, spent their time. And they were with their, with their folks. Most people think that in 1918, when they left Bear, that they went to Sarasota. They did not. They went to the Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut which had been the winter headquarters for Barnum and Bailey, because they owned Barnum and Bailey uh, from about seven, I think it was seven or eight. They owned Barnum and Bailey for a long time and ran Barnum and Bailey as a separate circus most people didn't realize. When they were going to Barnum and Bailey, they were really going to Ringling, uh, to a Ringling circus. By, uh, by 1918, the uh, Ringling brothers were the, the largest circus in the world. Tournament. They were huge. Uh, and the boys were doing very well. They were, they were millionaires. Uh, and wondering why the people in Bear who looked down, well, didn't look with great favor to them. Here, here, here's a Ringling boy, and when they divided up their money, one of the things they did in December was to divide up for profit, five weeks. And that each one, in some years, each person, each boy got $50,000. Well, the average income in Bear was about 1000 Making 50 times more. Uh, questions? Yes. Where and how did they get their acts? Uh, where and how did the Ringlings get their acts? In the early uh, days, uh, they ran ads uh, in the uh, in the show papers. There, there, there are today, as there were then, there are show papers. And in one of the early ads said, "Wanted leap." That's a trapeze person to <laughs> believe from. I thought it was an interesting language. But by the time they were really in, in the big time, John, uh, who uh, was the railroad guy, he spent uh, every winter in Europe. And, and he, he found many of the acts in Europe. Europe was uh, then, till it is, uh, a place where there are a lot of uh, circus performers. And he found many of their really outstanding acts in Europe. By the early 1900s, uh, they had 20 or 30 different languages spoken on the circus grounds because they had people from all over the world who were performers and, and working with them. But John, John would line up the circus acts, and at the same time, John was an interesting guy. He got interested in art collecting, and if any of you have a chance to visit the uh, uh, John Ringling's home in Sarasota, which is now uh, an art museum. It's his collection. It's the collection of art that, that John uh, found when he was uh, looking for a circus acts. In, in did, did that, did I get it through? Yes, that's what uh, Somebody over here, question? Anybody? Uh, they're talking to death. Did they just go out one city at a time, one show, or did they get to where they had more than one town at a time? Um, well, to, uh, I think what you're asking, Bob, is, Today, the Ringling Brothers have uh, three units, uh, a red unit, a blue unit, and a family unit. 
So they're in three different towns at a time. In those days, uh, yes, they were in two different towns at a time, but one was called Barnum and Bailey and one was called Ringling. So the Ringling Brothers, the, the Ringling show itself was never split in those days. One of the problems they had with 85 rail cars, they, uh, there were many towns couldn't accommodate them. They, they, their rail yard wasn't big enough. They didn't have enough side tracks uh, to put 85 rail cars. And, and so that, that meant that uh, a whole bunch of the little towns where they really got their start, they, they couldn't show anymore. And that caused some problems for them. Yes? I'm a little unclear on the Barnum connection. Um, did he sell outright to them? Or when you mentioned the five brothers yeah. coming together and planning, yeah. what, did he have input? Well, see, Barnum, Barnum had died uh, when he was out of the picture. Jim Bailey uh, owned Barnum and Bailey. Uh, Jim, Jim Bailey was the operator and owner of Barnum and Bailey for a long time. And then when Jim Bailey died, uh, that's when uh, the Ringlings bought uh, out the Barnum and Bailey show. They, they kept the Barnum and the Barnum name because th these old names have a lot of currency. Barnum today it still has a lot of currency. When people, when you say Barnum and Bailey, that has meaning. And of course, Jim Bailey and E.T. Barnum have been dead for years. Uh, names have have currency. It's just like you. The, I I had trouble. The Ringling name is copyrighted. You've got to be very careful how you use the Ringling name. It's, and these five brothers in a row, that was their trademark. They protected that. Uh, they were very careful about such things. So. Somebody else? Yes? When you were doing research, what, why was Columbus, Ohio a place that had a lot of information? Well, Columbus, Ohio, uh, as true of a lot of other places in the United States, was a, was, was, had a circus at one time. And let's see, the grandfather of the fellow who had all this material had worked for this circus. So he had, as a youngster, he developed an interest in, in circus. He, um, he was the, is the CEO of a company that makes equipment for the baking industry, stainless steel equipment for the baking industry. It nothing to do with the circus or whatever. Uh, but he had, when the, when the Ringlings left Baraboo in 1918, they essentially abandoned everything. They just didn't come back. They left all their records, everything. And that, a lot of the material was sold at auction or stolen. Uh, but this gentleman bought a lot of this material and has it in his basement in Columbus, Ohio. And one of the interesting things as a researcher was to uh, convince him that, one, I was legitimate. And then I went some fly-by-night trying to put something over on the ringlings because of how they treated elephants or something. So on, that one. Uh, and once he found out that I indeed was a legitimate historian, he not only uh, allowed me to, to, to look at the materials, but he, um, he helped me. He, he, he said, you can use my company's copy machine and all, whatever you want. I was there for a week. I copied nonstop all, everything I get my hands on, I, I photocopied. Because some of this material has, has, not, has not appeared anywhere before. I had, some of you know that I, I, I've written uh, history of the brewing industry in Wisconsin. And that was a, a business history. When I did that work, I learned how to analyze business records and, and, and how to figure out profits and, and losses and all that stuff. And, and for some, it was almost that way for me. To start out with an account book, it's, it's quite overwhelming to have every uh, uh, curry comb, 10 cents. What am I going to do with that? Uh, and all of this all the way through. I, I figured out a, a scheme for uh, figuring out how much money they made every year, how much money they uh, spent every year, where they spent it, on what did they spend it. Because one of the questions I started with is how, how in the world could, could seven brothers, uh, five uh, partners, how could they, as poor little kids, get so rich? I mean, I've been trying it for years. I can't get <laughs> close to that. Uh, well, 
And in and, fact, and also, the history of the circus, their bankruptcies all over the place. They, they, they closed down, they, they just have all, all kinds of problems. Well, I discovered in, in, in very carefully checking records year after year after tedious year, uh, that their profit percentage, almost year in and year out, fluctuated a little bit. What would you guess? Profit percentage. What's a grocery store? Two percent? Three percent? Any of you in business? Retail? It's supposed to be a six percent market, right? Mm -hmm. Grocery store is one time. It's supposed to have a six percent market. Six six percent. Percent. I don't know what it is. The Ringlings was 40. 40 percent. <laughs> and unbelievable. This is 50 cents a ticket. They never they never increased the price. It was always 50 cents. 50 cents for adults, quarter for kids. And not only for that 50 cents, you got chance to see the menagerie, and so many people had never seen a wild animal before, uh, an elephant or a tiger or a, a llama, a python, all of these animals. You got, and, and this is unbelievable, you got an hour-long concert, musical concert, uh, with some of the world's most renowned musicians leading the band, an hour, and it wasn't Razzmatazz, it was Chopin and Beethoven and Mozart. The Ringlings introduced the rural areas of the country to classical music for 50 cents. And of course, then an hour long show. So all of that for 50 cents. You got your money's worth, but they knew what they were doing. Now, the wages, what? 50 cents a day? For uh, people who were the roused about doing putting uh, putting up and down the uh, the canvas and three meals a day and a room or well, not a room a, a hammock and a, and a train that rumbled through the night uh, but that was enough 